Thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. My name is Daphne Malin, Senior Environmental Scientist in the Chemical Product Evaluation Team. And we're really excited to see so many people on the line and we'll be giving an update today on what the Safer Consumer Products Program, or SCP, has been up to since releasing our last Priority Products Work Plan last year. So this is a continuation of our stakeholder engagement process to gather information and make informed decisions as Safer Consumer Products moves closer to naming our next round of priority products. We have a full agenda today and a bunch of different speakers, so to help put a face to the voice you'll hear, um, here they are. We'll start with Dr. Meredith Williams, the Deputy Director for Safer Consumer Products, providing the opening remarks. And then we'll move on to Carl Palmer, our Branch Chief, giving an SCP program overview. Followed by Andre Algazi, the lead of our Chemical Products Evaluation Team, giving a work plan overview and update to help describe uh, how we got to where we are today. And then we'll move into why you've probably tuned in, is to hear about SCP's research topics that we've generated from the Priority Products Work Plan. So just to note, what you'll hear from these presenters are summaries of our work. We've prepared some background documents for each of these topics today, and we're going to post those on our website at noon. Um, so this, these documents will contain more uh, data, graphics, and references about what you'll be hearing. Um, so again, this is just a, a summary of our work. So the first presentation we'll have is from Dr. Ann Cooper Doherty. She's an environmental scientist presenting the potential aquatic impacts and continued uses of nonalphenol thoxalates and triclosan. Followed by Dr. Eric Shulow, our staff toxicologist presenting potential health and safety impacts of chemicals and nail products. And our last topic is presented by Dr. Simona Balan, our senior environmental scientist, presenting perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs, in carpets, rugs, upholstered furniture, and their care and treatment products. So one thing to note is that each of the topics has a slightly different set of next steps for stakeholder engagement, depending on the kinds of information we're asking for. So the presenters are, will give a short overview of those next steps in their presentations, and I'll elaborate a little bit and give some more context for those in the next steps. So then we'll move on to our clarifying questions, and after hearing any of those presenters, you can submit your questions through the chat feature of the webinar, and we'll address them at the end. And what we're hoping to do is address questions that um, better explain our topics that we've covered or our process. Um, so we may not have time to get into some long, detailed technical responses. We'll have other avenues for that. Um, but if we can't address your full questions, we will be able to refer you to the appropriate place or time to, to engage with us on that. Um, so, and also keep in mind, we'll have those technical background documents coming out shortly after the webinar, so, um, so stay tuned for that for more information as well. So really we want to just focus our webinar time today to explain our process and um, clarify what our topics include. Um, and lastly, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it later this week with the audio so you can go back and watch anything you may have missed. Uh, also, we'll be posting the slides shortly after the webinar so you can access any of those links that we refer to today. So with that, I would like to introduce Meredith Williams, Deputy Director for our program, to provide some opening remarks. Thank you, Daphne, and welcome to those of you participating. We're very glad to have such a strong turnout for this webinar. Our approach to implementing our work plan has been very much informed by our experience with our first three proposed priority products. We learned a great deal about each product from the full spectrum of stakeholders who provided input. And now that we have a three-year work plan in place, we're able to start our stakeholder process earlier in our decision making. And we view that stakeholder engagement as really truly integral to the implementation of the Safer Consumer Products regulations. So although we have a work plan and we do our staff research, in order to continue to narrow down the scope of the products that we will consider, we need stakeholder input. And then even after we've named or proposed a priority product, um, both in our pre-reg process as well as our APA process, rulemaking process, we will 
um, have plenty of opportunities for stakeholder input. And we're, we're very eager to start that engagement. Our staff has done an outstanding job researching product categories from our work plan, and they have a lot to share and discuss today and over the coming months. To that end, I'll keep my comments short and just thank you all for participating in today's call and invite you to continue to be in touch with us as we implement the SCP regulations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Carl Palmer, our branch chief for the Safer Consumer Products Branch. Thank you, Meredith. Good morning, everyone. For this portion of the webinar, I will be providing a high-level overview of the Safer Consumer Products Program and updates on the status of our current work. Safer Consumer Products Program's mission is to protect people and the environment from toxic chemicals and consumer products and to promote the development and use of safer alternatives. To achieve this goal, we adopted regulations which can be divided into four main steps. First, the regulations establish a list of candidate chemicals. In the regulations, we point to chemical lists already identified by other government or authoritative bodies. There are two types of lists. Hazard trait lists identify chemicals of concern because they have one or more specific hazard trait. For example, the chemical may be a carcinogen, a mutagen, a PBT, or a neurotoxin. The other type of lists are exposure potential lists. They identify chemicals where we are, con we are concerned about because they have been found either in people or in our air or water. Note that there are several types of chemicals which are excluded from our regulations, most prominently pesticides and prescription drugs. Most of the 23 lists that make up the candidate chemical list change periodically. As those lists change, the candidate chemical list changes as well. We monitor these lists and update our informational candidate chemicals list quarterly on CalSAFER, our program's web-based information management system. You can use CalSAFER to review the candidate chemical list or search the list by chemical name or CAS number. The second step in our regulatory framework requires that we at DTSC identify specific product chemical combinations of concern. We call these product chemical combinations priority products. Our regulations identify key prioritization principles and criteria for picking priority products. Namely, DTSC must pick products where there is potential for people or the environment to be exposed to one or more candidate chemicals in the product and where that exposure has potential to contribute to or cause significant or widespread adverse impacts. Or put more simply, we need to show that the chemicals in the product may cause harm to people or the environment. Our regulations also require that we give special consideration to environmentally sensitive habitats and sensitive subpopulations such as infants, children, pregnant women, and workers who may be at greater risk. The majority of today's webinar focuses on three specific areas where we are sharing information and concerns and asking questions which will assist us in evaluating and selecting the next set of potential priority products. Currently, we are working on adopting regulations that list our initial priority products in regulation. We are currently accepting public comments on our proposal listing a proposed listing of children's foam padded sleeping products that contain the flame retardants TDCPP or TCEP. The comment period for that rulemaking closes on November 21st. We will next be issuing a public notice for listing spray polyurethane foam systems containing methylene diphenyl diisocyanate or MDI. That rulemaking will be followed by proposed regulations listing paint strippers containing methylene chloride. While we've been going through the rulemaking process to list the initial priority products, we've concurrently been in the process of identifying the next set of potential priority products. You'll hear today about our current and future efforts to implement our 2015 to 2017 priority products work plan. Our regulations also provide a petition process for adding or removing priority products, candidate chemicals, or chemical lists. We've recently received a petition to list food cans with bisphenol A resin linings as a priority product. We are currently conducting a merits review of this petition. Additionally, in response to the governor's directive on lead acid batteries, we are beginning to evaluate whether or not lead acid batteries should be identified as a priority product subject to our regulations. 
This work will be done in coordination with our hazardous waste management programs, community protection, and hazardous waste reduction initiative. The third step in our regulatory framework is conducting an alternatives analysis for each priority product. The regulations require manufacturers of priority products conduct an alternatives analysis that compares the priority product with potential alternatives that use chemical substitution or product redesign. This process requires consideration of many factors throughout the entire priority product lifestyle and across a wide array of potential impacts. The narrative standards outlined in our regulations allow those conducting AAs a great amount of discretion and flexibility, but we also require public comment periods on AAs and transparency in how the analysis is conducted. In other words, we require you show your work. The Duma trade secrets and confidential business information will be redacted from public documents. We will soon be issuing our draft alternatives analysis guide for public review and comment. The AA guide provides useful approaches, methods, resources, tools, and examples of how to fulfill the regulatory requirements for alternatives analysis. This draft includes changes made in response to the input we received on the initial draft of the AA guide, which only covered the first stage AA. It also addresses the requirements for the second stage AA. When we issue the draft later this year, we will provide time for stakeholder comments and we will also conduct at least one webinar to go over the guide. The guide will be finalized in early 2017 prior to the effective date of our first priority product listings regulations. The fourth and final step of our framework is the regulatory response process. Our regulations provide that after we evaluate each alternatives analysis, we select a regulatory response if needed to protect public health or the environment. Options for regulatory responses range from requiring that manufacturers make information available to DTSC or to consumers, to requiring research funding or the establishment of end-of-life product stewardship programs. If necessary, DTSC may require additional product safety measures or the restriction or prohibition of priority product sales in California. Regulatory responses will only be considered upon evaluation of specific alternative analyses. Please monitor our website and sign up for our listserv to stay current on all our safer consumer products activities. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Andre Algazi, who will discuss where we are today in implementing the 2015-2017 Priority Works Priority Products Work Plan. Andre? Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> So uh, my name, again, is Andre Algazi. I lead our chemical and product evaluation team. And uh, the chemical product evaluation team, or CPET as we call it, is a relatively small team. We have about 15 tech, uh, staff of, from various disciplines in sciences, engineering, and law. Um, you're about to hear from several members of our team on this webinar. Uh, the team's primary job is to research products and chemicals and use the information we find to identify potential priority products. To do this, we collect data on the hazard traits of candidate chemicals, their uses in consumer products, and their potential to expose and harm people or, the, or environmental organisms. These are the key prioritization principles that Carl just spoke about. Our focus is on the product categories identified in the priority product work plan. So the current work plan, which covers 2015 to 2017, has five policy priorities, which are shown on this slide. The product categories in the work plan were chosen based on these priorities. As I'll discuss in a moment, we also use these policy priorities as we've begun to investigate groups of products within the broader categories in the work plan. Some of them, as you'll see, are very broad. Many of you will already be familiar with the seven product categories in our current work plan, which are shown here. As you can see, some of these, like beauty, personal care, and hygiene products, or cleaning products, are extremely broad. Our challenge has been to identify subsets of the several thousand chemicals on the candidate chemicals list and a subset of products from these seven categories on which to focus. Again, we're guided by the key prioritization principles. Our framework regulations don't specify a formula or algorithm for identifying or prioritizing products to identify priority products.
So I want to talk a little bit about how we arrived at the topics that you're going to be hearing about on today's webinar. So we began by looking at the product categories through the lens of those five policy priorities you saw in an earlier slide. And tried to refine our focus to, to a shorter, some shorter lists of candidate chemicals that are used in those product categories. Once we had generated shorter lists of chemicals, we took another look at the product categories to identify specific subcategories within them that contain <coughs> chemicals on those shorter lists and that also aligned, again, with our policy priorities. So based on this work in these sort of two phases, um, we looked at for some common themes, and we found several, which you'll see in the topics presented today. The first theme that we noticed was one around the policy priority of aquatic resources and water quality, de chemicals detected in water quality monitoring. Several chemicals popped up in, uh, that were um, aligning with that theme, um, specifically triclosan and nonalphenol ethoxylates, which are found in multiple product categories. Uh, another theme that emerged from this work was a theme of chemicals and products within a single product category, which was the beauty, personal care, and hygiene products. We identified a number of candidate chemicals and a group of products from this category, which are nail products, and you'll hear about that topic today too. And then finally, a third theme we, we found was that a specific class of chemicals was showing up in every one of the seven product categories in the work plan, which is the perfluoro and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs. And you'll be hearing about that topic later today as well. So this webinar is really just the beginning of a dialogue with our stakeholders. As of today, we haven't identified any specific product chemical combinations to be our next priority products. And your input will help fill data gaps and refine our thinking, which will help us to identify and prioritize our evaluation. We hope you'll actively engage with us in the coming months, and we're confident that through this dialogue, we'll be ready to make well-informed decisions when the time comes to name our next priority products. You're about to hear from several members of our team who will give you an overview of these topics, and I'll hand it back to Daphne to get us started. Great. Thank you, Andre, for summarizing uh, how we got to these topics today. So we're going to move on to the next part of the webinar, and that's to hear about these three topic summaries we've been discussing. Um, so recall we'll have more information on these topics posted in our background document that's going up today on our CalSAFER website at noon, promptly at noon California time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ann Cooper Doherty, our environmental scientist. Thank you, Daphne. Today I'll be discussing the potential aquatic impacts and continued uses of nonalphenol ethoxylates and triclosan. So as Andre just mentioned, DTSC's priority product work plan highlighted policy priorities that we've been using to narrow down the product categories. One of these priorities was a focus on chemicals that may adversely impact aquatic resources or that have been observed through water quality monitoring. In focusing on aquatic impacts, we ended up with two chemicals or classes of chemicals that spanned multiple product categories. And those were nonalphenol ethoxylates, or MPEs, and triclosan. So this table represents some identified product types that may contain these chemicals, and you can see some similarities across the product categories. MPEs are mostly used as surfactants and can be found in cleaning products like laundry detergent or commercial and household cleaners, and they can also be found in clothing. Triclosan is often used as an antimicrobial or as a preservative, and in cleaning products it can be in things like dish soap or possibly laundry products. It can also be found in clothing and in personal care products like soaps, deodorants, and cosmetics. So the pathway to the aquatic environment from consumer products is not always clear, so I wanted to walk through a conceptual model that we've put together. This conceptual model helps illustrate our understanding of the potential routes of exposure to NPEs and triclosan from cleaning, clothing, and personal care products, particularly those affecting the aquatic environment. There are many ways for an NPEs and triclosan to find their way into household drains in the wastewater system. 
NPEs and triclosanin products like laundry detergents or soaps can be washed directly down the drain, or washing clothes containing these chemicals can also result in their down the drain release. NPEs and triclosanin have also been detected in indoor dust, which can find its way down the drain as well. So once these chemicals make their way down the drain, they enter the wastewater system and are transported to local wastewater treatment plants. Here the chemicals are removed to varying extents, after which the remaining NPEs, triclosan, and their transformation and degradation products are released to local aquatic environments as wastewater effluent. This direct release is a pathway of major concern. Additionally, products like biosolids or treated sewage sludge can be land applied to agricultural fields and recycled water or treated effluent can be used for irrigation and landscaping. Both of these uses, which may increase in the future, may contribute NPEs and triclosan to runoff from the land, which can serve as an additional source of these chemicals to local aquatic environments. Once the chemicals reach the aquatic environment, organisms can be exposed to NPEs and triclosan in the surface water or sediments. We know that these chemicals are being released to the aquatic environment through these and potentially other pathways based on detection of NPEs and triclosan in wastewater effluent, surface water, sediments, and aquatic organisms. So we're concerned about the presence of NPEs in the aquatic environment for a number of reasons. One of the most important is that nonalphenol phosphates, shown in the top structure, degrade to nonalphenol, the bottom structure, in wastewater treatment plants in the environment. This is of concern because of effects on aquatic organisms from exposure to nonalphenol, which may include reproductive toxicity, altered endocrine activity, and developmental impairment. Nonalphenol can also, in some environmental conditions, persist and bioaccumulate. Triclosan also has concerns for the aquatic environment, including acute aquatic toxicity to crustaceans, fish, and algae. And similar to NPEs, they can persist and bioaccumulate in certain environmental conditions. Additionally, one of triclosan's transformation products, methyl triclosan, whose structure is in the bottom right corner, may actually be more persistent and bioaccumulative than triclosan itself. So why have we focused on NPEs and triclosan in particular? In our research, we found that agencies across California have expressed concern about the presence of NPEs and triclosan in aquatic environments and waste streams. In 2009, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project was asked by the California State Water Resources Control Board to convene a panel of national experts to provide unbiased recommendations of chemicals for statewide monitoring based on exposure and toxicity concerns. Nonalphenol and triclosan were two of the 15 final chemicals that were recommended in this report. Additionally, the San Francisco Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality prioritized nonalphenol and nonalphenol ethoxylates as of concern for San Francisco Bay, including, with, including them with other well-known aquatic contaminants like PBDEs. In Southern California, the Orange County Sanitation District provides high-quality effluent for recycling water through groundwater recharge. They submitted a comment on our draft priority product work plan identifying triclosan as one of their priority pollutants and asked that we keep these pollutants in mind when naming future priority products. And finally, in their 2016 pollution prevention plan, the city of Palo Alto indicated that they strongly support DTSC safer consumer products work and urged DTSC to focus future regulations on triclosan. So as a result of concerns about MPEs in the aquatic environment, the use of MPEs in consumer products has been influenced by market and regulatory changes. <clears throat> For example, ECHA, the European Chemicals Agency, has restricted the use of MPEs in most industrial, institutional, and domestic cleaning products, cosmetic products, and most personal care products, and has more recently restricted the use of MPEs in textiles to be implemented by 2021. In the United States, the EPA proposed a significant new use rule, or SNR, for certain NPEs in 2014. This SNR, if finalized, would require manufacturers to give notice to the EPA before using these NPEs in new ways that might create concerns. EPA has also entered into an agreement with the Textile Rental Service Association of America for a voluntary phase-out of NPEs in some commercial laundry detergents. 
The Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals Program, or ZDHC, which is an initiative of the textile industry, has also added NPEs to their Manufacturing Restricted Substances list. And the California Air Resources Board's consumer product regulations prohibit the use of NPEs in five specific types of cleaning products. On the non-regulatory side, in 2016, Walmart announced that it will require suppliers to list NPEs on packaging of formulated products by 2018 and has asked manufacturers to reduce, restrict, or eliminate their use. Additionally, Procter & Gamble phased out the use of NPEs and laundry detergents in 2016. And references for these regulations and, mar and market trends can be found in our background document. So in line with these regulatory and market activities, concern for the impact of NPEs on the aquatic environment has also led multiple organizations to conduct assessments of NPE alternatives. BizNGO recently completed one following California's guidelines for an alternatives analysis. Europe's Substitution Support Panel, or SUBSPORT, and EPA's DFE, which is now Safer Choice, conducted assessments in the last few years. And ECHA, as part of their document released with their MPEs and textile phase-out, also assessed the available alternatives. There's also been action by, ma by manufacturers and regulators concerning the use of triclosan in consumer products. Most recently, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a final rule indicating that hand and body wash manufacturers must reformulate their products to remove triclosan or remove their product from the market. In Europe, in 2015, the ECHA Biocidal Products Committee did not approve the use of triclosan in biocidal products used for human hygiene due to risk to surface water in the food chain. And on a more local level, just this year, Minnesota banned the sale of cleaning products for sanitizing or hand body cleansing that contains triclosan. And similarly to NPEs, Walmart will now require suppliers to list triclosan on pro packaging of most formulated products by 2018 and has asked manufacturers to reduce, restrict, or eliminate its use as well. As we found with NPEs, there's obvious movement by regulators and some manufacturers away from triclosan use in consumer products. So given the state, national, and international concern over the use of triclosan and NPEs in consumer products, and the potential impact on the aquatic environment, there are four main themes that DTSC seeks to learn more about. The first is NPEs in cleaning and clothing products. The second is triclosan product uses, removal, and substitution. The third is aquatic hazards and detections of NPEs and triclosan. And the fourth is other candidate chemicals or products. So more on the first one, we're specifically looking for things like what are the challenges in removing NPEs from products like laundry detergents, cleaning pro products, or the clothing supply chain. And specific to the clothing supply chain, what progress has been made to remove NPEs? On the second topic, what is the safety or benefit of triclosan in identified products? And what are the challenges of removing or replacing triclosan in those products? And finally, what are the chemical and non-chemical alternatives? For aquatic hazards and detections, we're interested in hearing about the most recent wastewater and aquatic monitoring data for chemicals like NPEs, nonalphenol, triclosan, methyl triclosan, and other transformation products, and also learning about which hazard traits are most well understood for these chemicals. And finally, we're interested in understanding what other candidate chemicals may be of concern due to aquatic impacts, as well as what are other continued uses of uh, things like nonalphenol, phosphates, and toilet paper, for example, or triclosan and products like building products. So there'll be many opportunities for stakeholders to be engaged in the process and provide information to DTSC. The first step is the stakeholder engagement survey, where we're trying to understand who wants to be a part of this process. And that will be due November 30th, um, later this month, and the link is provided here. You can also read our background document, which has more details than we're able to provide in this webinar and outlines all of our questions in more detail. We will be having stakeholder meetings over the next few months, and you can provide input on some proposed dates for those meetings in the survey. And finally, if you have data or other input on the questions we've provided, you can provide that information to us through CalSAFER, our online data management system. And that information is due by February 28th of 2017. So with that, thank you for your attention, and we look forward to hearing from you, and I will hand it back to Daphne. Great. 
Thank you, Ann Cooper. Um, so thanks for that summary. And if you guys have any questions for Ann Cooper or any of the other presenters you've heard today, uh, please make sure you submit them using the chat feature of the webinar. You might have to open up the chat box to, to be able to click on that. And, um, and we'll move on to the next topic that's presented by Eric Shulo, our staff toxicologist. Thank you, Daphne. Hello, and welcome to this section of the webinar, which focuses on the potential health and safety impacts of chemicals and nail products. Our interest in this topic actually began as early as 2011 when DTSC conducted an investigation and tested nail products from distributors labeled as 3-free, meaning free of formaldehyde, toluene, and dibutyl phthalate, otherwise referred to as the toxic trio. The results of this investigation showed that some of these products actually contained one or more of these chemicals, raising concerns regarding proper labeling of ingredients and potential exposure to salon workers. Since that time, there has been an increase in public awareness regarding nail product ingredients and safety concerns to salon workers. <clears throat> this was in large part due to a number of articles published by the New York Times. One article in particular focused primarily on potential exposure concerns to salon workers from chemicals and nail products. Our 2015-2017 Priority Product Work Plan provided us with a unique opportunity to further explore this issue under the Safer Consumer Products Program and initiate a dialogue with the public and interested stakeholders. Under the general category of personal care products, we identified the aforementioned chemicals, formaldehyde, toluene, and dibutyl phthalate, the toxic trio as a starting point for this engagement. In addition, triphenylphosphate was also included on the basis that it was found during DTSC's 2011 sampling investigation to be a commonly used alternative for dibutyl phthalate. And finally, a list of candidate chemicals believed to be in nail products was compiled in order to be inclusive of other potential chemicals of interest to the public and stakeholders. Just recently, in September of 2016, a number of assembly bills passed the California legislature that is relevant to this topic and worth noting. AB 2125, the creation of a Healthy Nail Salon Recognition Program was passed to provide a means for salons in California to enter into a voluntary recognition program that provides incentives to those businesses who agree to use nail products free of potentially harmful chemicals and improve worker safety in the workplace. DTSC will play a role in the implementation of this program. In addition, AB 2437 and AB 2025 aim to improve language access in order to better inform workers regarding any potential risks they may encounter. So this ultimately begs the question, why nail products? Why are we concerned about their use and safety? Well, first, there are a wide variety of chemicals in nail products, many of which are candidate chemicals and they can vary considerably depending on the type of product. And as I mentioned earlier, nail salon workers are of particular concern as well as consumers. An overwhelmingly majority of nail salon workers are women of color and of reproductive age. They are often immigrant workers who face language barriers, have limited education and chemical exposure from nail products, have limited use of personal protective equipment such as gloves and respirators, and they often work in excess of eight-hour workdays or 40-hour work weeks. There is also concern for pregnant women and their fetuses, as well as children. One quick but important point should be made here regarding child exposure. An observation of salon workers has revealed that their children may accompany them to the workplace. They also represent a sensitive subpopulation and are important to include in this discussion. Here are some examples of the types of nail products that fall into this topic. These types include, but are not limited to, nail polish and coatings, base adhesives, nail hardeners, nail conditioners, artificial and gel nails, nail product thinners, and nail polish removers. Here is a table showing the four highlighted chemicals, formaldehyde, toluene, dibutyl phthalate, and triphenylphosphate, their functional use, and their hazard traits. These four were identified as chemicals of interest due to our earlier investigations and as a result of our preliminary scoping of chemicals under the FCP program. Formaldehyde is a preservative. It's used as a nail hardening agent and is considered to be an established inhalation carcinogen with respiratory toxicity. Toluene is a solvent and supplemental thinner with developmental and neurotoxic hazard capabilities. 
Dibutyl phthalate is a plasticizer with potential endocrine disrupting action, as well as other toxic endpoints. Triphenyl phosphate is a plasticizer alternative to dibutyl phthalate and is potentially neurotoxic with reproductive and endocrine disrupting actions. This is a list of candidate chemicals believed to be present in nail products. It was compiled from the California Department of Public Health Safe Cosmetics Database as known or suspected to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm, as well as those chemicals identified during DTSC's 2011 sampling investigation. This list is included in the NAILS background document for your reference, and I've included links at the bottom to both the California Department of Public Health Safe Cosmetics Database and DTSC's 2012 report. This brings us to exposure potential. Nail products contain volatile chemicals which have the potential to off-gas to indoor air and result in human inhalation exposure. Some nail products contain chemicals that may be absorbed dermally. This exposure is likely affected by poor ventilation or lack of personal protective equipment use such as respirators or gloves, long work days or weeks, the number of clients in a given day or week, meteorological or weather conditions, and building properties. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, there is an increase in public awareness around nail products, specifically those products considered to be safer or free of specific chemicals. This is impacting markets and regulatory actions globally. There are, are, there are already a number of nail products marketed as three, five, seven, and nine free, products which purportedly do not contain the toxic trio and other chemicals of interest. As a result, a number of cities and counties throughout California have already engaged in voluntary healthy nail salon programs. Some businesses, such as Walmart, have taken the initiative by identifying, by identifying eight high priority chemicals, including formaldehyde, dibutyl phthal phthalate, and toluene, and asked suppliers to remove these chemicals from a variety of products, including nail products. Under their policy, Manufacturers must list the targeted ingredients on packaging by 2018 and work to find safer alternatives. The European Union has instituted some regulatory actions regarding cosmetics and does not allow dibutyl phthalate to be intentionally added. In addition, formaldehyde is restricted to a maximum concentration of 5% with additional language regarding use and safety of these products. In summary, DTSC is seeking input from stakeholders on chemicals and nail products due to hazard traits associated with the toxic trio and awareness of other candidate chemicals and nail products, the potential exposure and adverse impacts to workers and consumers in California, especially to pregnant women, children, and people of color, and associated nail salon worker safety legislation. With that, we come to our themes and questions for stakeholders. And I'd like to remind you that these themes, as well as specific questions not all listed here, will be provided in the NAILS background document that you will be receiving later today. So first, DTSC seeks to learn more about chemicals and nail products, their presence, their functional use, hazard traits, endpoints, and exposure information. For example, to what extent are toluene, dibutyl phthalate, formaldehyde, triphenyl phosphate, and the other candidate chemicals listed in the table still used in nail products, and in what types of products? What other candidate chemicals are used in nail products that DTSC should consider? And are there non-candidate chemicals used in nail products that DTSC should consider? Second, we would like to learn more about alternative chemicals in nail products marketed as green, safer, or free of specific chemicals. Please provide information such as hazard, exposure, functional use, prevalence, etc., on safer alternative chemicals used in nail products. Are these alternatives functionally equivalent to the potentially hazardous chemicals currently used? And why are they not being used industry-wide? What obstacles exist to the wider adoption of these alternative chemicals? Third, we are seeking any information around product formulations or manufacturing information. Are there specific sectors of the industry which include candidate chemicals in their product formulations? 
Are there different formulations for major versus smaller manufacturers or for products designed for salon use versus those sold by retailers? Are there differences in products sold by large retailers compared to small retailers or discount stores or compared to more upmarket stores? And finally, DTSC seeks to learn more about any initiatives by manufacturers of nail products designed to improve chemical safety. Are there any industry-wide standards, guidelines, or advisories for formulating nail products to ensure and improve product safety, including evaluating chemical hazards and phasing out or introducing new chemicals? Moving forward, here is a web link to the Stakeholder Engagement Survey through SurveyMonkey. We would like to hear from you and we ask that you please respond by November 30th, 2016. We also invite you to read our NAILS background document and provide feedback to our questions through CalSAFER by February 28, 2016. We also plan to hold an upcoming public workshop as well as possible stakeholder meetings as needed with specific dates still to be determined, but in the range of mid-January to mid-February. On behalf of the NAILS team, I'd like to thank you for your attention and participation. And now, back to Daphne. Thank you, Eric. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we got a couple questions on next steps, and so just keep in mind after this presentation here from Simona, we'll be going, going into some more detail on that. Um, so with that, we'll move on to our last technical presentation today by Simona Ballon, our Senior Environmental Scientist. Thank you, Daphne. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today as we begin this dialogue about perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs, in carpets, rugs, upholstered furniture, and their care and treatment products, which means um, things like fabric protector sprays used for stain or waterproofing. So just a quick note before we delve any deeper. Um, the nomenclature may be a little confusing. You may have heard these chemicals being referred to as uh, perfluorinated chemicals or PFCs or highly fluorinated chemicals or fluorochemicals. Um, but here, for, for best accuracy, we're using the PFAS nomenclature proposed by Buck et al. in 2011. So overall, this topic is a little different from the previous ones you've heard today because we're talking now about a whole class of man-made chemicals. By some estimates, there are more than 3,000 chemicals belonging to this class. Um, and they have been used in a wide range of industries since the 1950s, for instance, to make products waterproof or resistant to soil, oil, and other stains. All chemicals that belong to this class contain at least one carbon that is fully fluorinated, meaning that all the carbon-hydrogen bonds in that molecule have been replaced with carbon-fluorine bonds. And this carbon-fluorine bond is one of the strongest bonds in chemistry. And because of that, it leads to environmental persistence. It makes the chemicals very difficult to degrade in the environment. We included here this uh, graph from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, to show you just how complex and chemically diverse this class is. And this is an important point because different chemical structures may lead to different behaviors in the environment, to different exposure pathways or potential toxicities. So as you can see, there are several different subgroups of PFASs, including non-polymers and polymers. And uh, the subgroup that has been most widely studied is the one here at the top, perfluoroalkyl acids, or PFAAs. And this includes things like perfluoroalkyl carboxylic acids, or um, uh, the most common example of that, the best known example is PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid, or perfluorooctanoate. And um, also perfluoroalkyl sulfonic acids, such as PFOS, or perfluorooctanoic sulfonate. So these are PFOS and PFOA are um, the best studied PFASs to date. Um, they have been used for the manufacturing of other PFASs, such as uh, fluoropolymers used in many consumer products. And um, other PFASs can break down into PFOA, PFOS, and uh, perfluoroalkyls like these. So as Carl and Andres said earlier, we are investigating here in the Safer Consumer Products Program candidate chemicals and product combinations with potential for chemical exposures that may cause adverse impacts. So why are we looking at PFASs in particular? Well, first of all, all PFASs are candidate chemicals for the Safer Consumer Products Program because the entire class is now on the Biomonitoring California list of priority chemicals. 
Also, based on publicly available information, PFASs have apparent hazard traits, including aquatic toxicity and terrestrial ecotoxicity, as well as several potential adverse human health effects, such as endocrine disruption and cancer. Unlike other persistent organic pollutants, PFASs tend to accumulate in protein-rich organs, such as the liver, lungs, kidneys, and may lead to organ toxicity. Uh, but most of this research to date, um, at least the one that is available in the public domain, comes from longer chain perfluoroalkyl acids, such as PFOA and PFOS, though there are some indications that other PFASs may have similar hazard traits. Also, there is a documented potential for human and ecological exposures to PFASs. Um, they have been found in a wide range of environmental samples around the world, including indoor air and dust, drinking water, and food. And this is due to their inherent characteristics that lead to persistence and long-range transport. Uh, PFASs are generally very persistent in the environment. Again, that's because of the very strong carbon-fluorine bond. Um, and if they do break down in the environment, they break down into other PFASs that are very persistent. Many PFASs are also known to bioaccumulate in plants, animals, and humans. And um, the elimination half-lives for many PFASs in the human body are especially long, like on the order of years. PFASs have been found in nearly all humans tested, including newborns. A recent review paper even says that there is no unexposed control population anymore. Mothers transfer PFASs through the placenta and breastfeeding, so babies are born with PFASs in their bodies, and they receive additional loads through their diet after birth. So PFASs are used in all the 2015-2017 Safer Consumer Products work plan product categories, um, but for the purpose of this um, this research phase, we are focusing on the building products and household office furniture and furnishings, in particular carpets, rugs, and upholstered furniture, as well as their care and treatment products, which belong to the cleaning products category. So why did we choose to focus on these products? Well, first of all, um, this is relevant to most people in general. Um, the um, carpets make up about, they make up more than 50% of the total U.S. flooring sale. So this really, these really are products that are found in most people's homes and um, impact a lot of people. Also, the, um, a significant proportion of the total PFAS production is um, used in carpets and other textile applications. By some estimates, as much as 50% of the total PFAS production is used in such products. Also, PFASs are being released from these products into the environment throughout the entire life cycle of the product, including during use. For instance, um, a study conducted for the PFAS manufacturer 3M estimated that about 50% of the PFAS treatment is removed over the nine-year life of a carpet due to walk walking and vacuuming. So there are many pathways and sources of exposure to PFASs for humans and biota, but I'll only talk here about the ones most relevant to our 2015-2017 work plan, though there are others as well. Um, so during normal use, consumer products such as carpets, rugs, and upholstered furniture release PFASs into indoor air and dust. And from there, humans and other living organisms may be exposed to PFASs by inhaling and ingesting the contaminated air or dust. Um, also, the application of care and treatment products, uh, particularly in the home or um, after purchase of these products, results in an additional direct exposure via inhalation and ingestion. Exposure can also happen by direct contact with a product. This is especially true for children who may be touching the carpet, rug, or furniture, then bringing their hands to their mouth, or even chewing on the objects themselves. But beyond this direct exposure from contact or proximity to these PFAS-treated products, available evidence also suggests that carpets and other textile-based consumer products are a potentially major source of PFAS to food and drinking water, which is a significant source of exposure for humans. So for instance, landfills um, contain manufacturing waste and discarded consumer products treated with PFASs, such as carpet, dress, and upholstered furniture. Some of these PFASs are released from landfills, mainly through leaching and volatilization. 
Um, then wastewater treatment plants that collect these landfill leachates, as well as surface runoff and wastewater from residential and commercial buildings, cannot effectively remove the PFASs. So this means that PFASs can then be released into groundwater and surface water, like Ann Cooper or Doherty um, described earlier in her talk. Um, so that includes PFASs getting into drinking water sources. They also accumulate in sewage sludge, then get applied to soils as biosolids and can be taken up by crops destined for human consumption or for animal feed. And I also want to point out that, as far as we know, this is basically a closed cycle. And you can see that also from this figure here. So due to their high environmental persistence, there is no no natural exit route for PFASs once they've been added to consumer products. They just keep cycling between humans and biota and the environment. What this means is that levels of PFASs in the environment, humans and biota, may continue to rise for as long as these chemicals are being added to consumer products. So in sum, PFASs in carpets, rugs, upholstered furniture, and their care and treatment products address all the policy priorities identified in our 2015-2017 work plan. There are clear exposure pathways. The PFASs have been detected in biomonitoring studies in almost everyone tested around the world. They have been found in indoor air and dust. They may impact children and workers more than the general population because of higher exposure levels. For instance, children are not only transferred PFASs from their mothers, but they're also in closer contact with carpets and furniture and ingest more dust per body weight. Workers in carpet and furnishing stores also have higher levels of exposure due to higher concentrations of PFASs in indoor air and dust inside those um, stores. PFASs also have the potential to adversely impact aquatic resources uh, through a similar mechanism like the one that Ann Cooper described for triclosan and NPEs, and uh, they have been detected through water quality monitoring. But over the past few years, PFASs have been brought to the attention of regulators, the media, and the general public, and the use of the chemicals has changed. For instance, as a result of the US EPA's 2010-2015 stewardship program, the major US manufacturers have phased out PFOA, its precursors, and related longer chain PFASs. And um, also the US EPA significant new use rule, or SNR, has drastically reduced the imports of PFOA-containing <coughs> products. However, long chain PFASs continue to be produced in certain parts of the world. But overall, such efforts in the U.S. and internationally have led to a shift from longer to shorter chain PFASs, as well as to fluorinated ethers and other types of PFASs, such as branched or cyclic compounds, that aren't as well studied in terms of potential toxicities and behavior in the environment. Some product manufacturers have gone a step further and phased out PFAS-based treatments, by either using non-fluorinated alternatives or removing stain-resistant treatments altogether. So given these recent changes in the use patterns of PFASs, the DTSC seeks to learn more about specific PFASs currently used in carpets, rugs, upholstered furniture, and their care and treatment products. For instance, where in the production cycle are these chemicals being applied and how? We're also interested in exposure data on PFASs used in these product categories, um, we also want to learn more about the toxicity, especially of new PFASs, such as the shorter chains and the fluorinated ethers, including the molecular level mechanisms of action. So how are the chemicals causing those observed effects? What are the differences, if any, among the different subclasses of PFASs? We also request information about the life cycle of PFASs in consumer products and about non-fluorinated alternatives and other opportunities for reducing exposures and potential adverse impacts. So we have a more detailed list of uh, questions, I guess a total of 12 questions that will be posted at noon Pacific time today on our information management system, CalSAFER. So we encourage you to go to CalSAFER and read our background document, which will also be posted there at noon, and that has a lot more information that I was able to present here. It also has our bibliography. Um, so please have a look at that and uh, do look at the list of questions that will be posted on CalSAFER. We would very much appreciate your input by December 30th, 2016. So it's a little earlier than for the other teams. Um, and that's because your answers to these questions will help shape our public workshop 
which is scheduled for January 31st, 2017 at our headquarters in Sacramento. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers, presenters, and panelists, and we hope you can make it in person to contribute to this dialogue, um, but even if you cannot make it in person, you will be able to listen in via webcast. So please feel free to contact us if you have questions or can provide additional information that can help the department's evaluation of PFASs in these product categories. And um, yeah, we thank you very much for your attention. We look forward to hearing from you in the coming months and maybe seeing you in January at the workshop. So thank you and uh, back to Daphne now. Great. All right, thank you, Simona. So that wraps up our technical presentations. And uh, so you've heard some, a short summary of some of these next steps about how we're gonna be engaging with stakeholders in the upcoming months. So I wanted to give a little bit more context for what you've heard. Um, and recap some of these key dates and go into a little bit more detail on that. So first up, as you've been hearing us refer to our background documents, they'll be posted on CalSAFER, that's our information management system today at noon. So there's a little sneak peek of what those look like. Um, so what they have is a little bit more detail from what you've heard today, including our references. And uh, we're also highlighting questions that we have and where we're seeking some information from stakeholders. So that'll help guide our, our conversations with you guys moving forward. And also that background document um, helps us frame some of these upcoming, upcoming conversations. We want to have um, some, um, some public engagement, some stakeholder engagement, with two, purpo two purposes, really. It's one, to open up dialogue about our questions and data gaps and also to hear from you on any of the other considerations that you have for us. We'll be doing the stakeholder engagement in a variety of different ways. We'll use conference calls, webinars, roundtable discussions, and also host workshops. Um, so the dates of these are a little bit morphing, and, uh, but we will make sure to post those at least two weeks in advance, and we'll post it on our workshops webpage, and we will also send out um, information on our e-list. And you've heard a couple of these teams talk about the stakeholder engagement survey. And what this is for is to help us better organize those round those roundtable discussions or workshops. And we want to get a better sense of who would be an active participant at those roundtable discussions. We want to make sure the meeting dates that we have penciled in would work for you um, and any other communication methods that are preferable. Again, we really want to make sure that we're available for you as well to discuss our questions and get to priority products in a transparent way. So we'll be sending out those surveys um, shortly after the webinar to help facilitate some of these meeting details for, this is again for the aquatic and nails topics. Um, in that survey, just to note, we're, there's a little box to ask you about um, to provide a short summary of the types of data you'd be providing. And so this is just a general comment box. We're not asking you to actually submit your data or your findings or anything. This is just to kind of give us an idea of, um, of your expertise. So uh, again, the comments that we are asking for will be done through CalSAFER. That's our information management system. And this is what CalSAFER looks like. Here's the URL. Um, so you can do a few different things in CalSAFER. It's our overall repository for uh, DTSCs, Safer Consumer Products documentation. You can search our candidate chemicals database to go back and look at any of the, the candidate chemicals we've referred to today. Um, you can also submit a petition for us to add a, a chemical to our list or a product to our priority products list. Um, and today what we're talking about really is making a comment. So, you know, what, where we're at now is more of a request for information, some data gathering, um, but in the CalSAFER system it's all lumped under this term of uh, making a comment. Um, so what you'll do at noon today, once you, can, once you can click through this, is click on make a comment. And you'll get to all of the documents the DTSC has had available for public comment. And you'll see the three topics we've discussed, we've discussed today. Um, and if you want, you can also filter it down here. We're referring to these as work plan implementation. And then once you click on the topic that's of interest to you, you'll see a short summary of that, um, some supporting documentation, the, the document that we're requesting um, comment or data on. And also to note, on the right-hand side, there's this comment period. Um, and what, what's important here is the closing date. So the closing date is the end 
of the time in which we'll be taking these comments. And so since it is an IT system, it will um, stop you from being able to submit a comment after that time closes out. So please make sure you follow the dates. They are different between the three topics. So once you click on that um, submit a comment section here at the bottom, you'll be guided through a, a short series of um, little forms for you to submit some general information and include attachments and whatnot. And in the end, DTSC will, um, to go through the comments, make sure all the attachments you know, are appropriate to post. And any stakeholder in DTSC, we use this platform to then retrieve the comments. So what you'll see is um, what people have entered, so submit their name and their organization. These are all fields that are optional but are really helpful for, um, for us and for any user to go ahead and, and understand our comments. You'll see categories, that's the area in which they're commenting on, those are some preset fields you'll see, and also this short summary box that says comment. And so that's a really great place to summarize what's in your comment letter. So um, DTSE can then you know, triage the different comments to different places or people depending on the nature of the comment. And also as a user, as a general user, you can kind of get a preview of what's in the comment letter without having to click and open up the attachment. So about the attachments, we do require that they are PDFs, um, less than 25 megabytes, and you can include multiple documents in, um, in your comment. So, um, and then the other little side note here is that if you do have information that you that you consider to be confidential business information, please don't submit it through CalSafer. Please talk to us first, and, and we can figure out some next steps from there. All right, so we've heard a bunch of meeting dates and a bunch of different types of engagement that we're going to have going on that differs between the, the three topics. And that's because the nature of our questions are different. And so... With the aquatic topic, the focus is really on these roundtable meetings, and we're hoping to host those in January and February of 2017. And, um, and like I mentioned earlier, that stakeholder survey will help guide the agenda, um, where we hold the meeting, how we hold the meeting, if it will be in person or over webinar. And um, so that will be the bulk of our stakeholder engagement. And then what we'd like to do in February, end of February, is have more of a traditional workshop in which um, we can echo back what we've heard so far and also allow for any other remaining comments for people to, um, to let us know then at that workshop. And then that will basically close out our comment period for that topic. For the NAILS, again, we also have a survey to better understand our stakeholders and see how to best engage. And we'll be hosting some meetings um, sometime between mid-January to mid-February. Uh, guided by the results of that stakeholder survey. And again, the comment period will then close out upon completion of those meetings. The PFAS topic, uh, we are asking for you to submit your comments and documents by the end of December. And again, that informs this stakeholder engagement workshop that we're holding on January 31st. So please do make sure you get your comments submitted by then so we can um, organize that meeting appropriately. So what this is intending to show is there's a lot of opportunities to engage with us in this process and we want to make sure that our discussions are transparent and our process is transparent and clear. Um, and so we're going to maintain all this information through our website and we have a workshops website for safer consumer products and we also use our e-list especially as all these meeting dates are going to be coming up. So once we get all of your, um, your comments and data and information, we'll be meeting with you in the stakeholder engagement process. What we'll do is we're going to review what we've heard and we're going to start making decisions about where to focus any of our further research efforts. And so if you've been following our program, you may have seen um, some product chemical profiles that we've released for three, pri uh, three proposed priority products. And so once we release the profile, there's another workshop, so more opportunity for stakeholder engagement. And this is all done before going to rulemaking, which has its own public process as well. And upon completion of adopting those as official priority products in, uh, in regulation, that's when the alternatives analysis process kicks in. So it is a way down the road. Uh, we're not at alternatives analysis yet. 
and then subsequent to that AA process is the regulatory response. So um, there are a few different places to contact us, depending on what you're looking to do. I've mentioned our e-list. That is our number one way to reach out to stakeholders. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do. Um, the link is provided here. Also, if you have general questions, you can email us directly at saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov, and it is uh, looked at every day. Um, for immediate inquiries, you can please contact Ben Adokpai, and his number is provided here. If you have any technical questions, please email our team lead, andre.algazi at dtsc.ca.gov. And if you'd like to meet with us directly, please contact Heather Kessler at dtsc.ca.gov. So, um, so that closes out our next steps, and we can move on to the Q&A portion of the agenda. It looks like we've had a lot of comments coming in, and we're triaging who's going to be responding to what. So, um, so I will lead it off to Carl to start. Um, well, we have uh, we've received um, I think five or six emails with a variety of questions in them, and we're going to sort of divide and conquer on answering those as best we can. And I believe Andre is uh, going to address the first question. Okay, actually, I have two questions here. The first one says, does, uh, the, does your background document include a list of NPEs by CAS number? And I, I think there's an infinite number of NPEs, basically. Yeah. So uh, uh, short answer, no. <laughs> a second uh, question here, uh, you want to clarify that a bit? Yeah, I think can I, oh, yeah. Okay, so we didn't include the CAS numbers in, in the background document. We're referring to any of the chemicals in our background document as candidate chemicals. So if you go back to that CalSAFER website, you can access our database. And like, on, like uh, Carl referenced early in the presentation, the candidate chemicals list is a list of lists. So we can only go forward with chemicals that are on some of these other lists. So however NPEs is defined in the candidate chemicals list is the, the nature in which we would go forward with it. Thank and you. Same, same for the other chemicals, such as PFASs, which is also a very long list of chemicals. Right. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Uh, and next uh, question, I understand why NPEs have been selected from an ecotoxicity standpoint, but this class does not lend itself to an alternative analysis process. As you pointed out, AAs have already been conducted by other agencies, and there are already numerous appropriate alternatives on the market. Replacing NPEs is simply a matter of transitioning supply chains to these alternatives, which is in progress for the clothing industry. So why focus on this class in a green chemistry program that has a focus on alternatives assessment? So at this point, we aren't asking for an alternatives analysis. Um, this is the type the type of info, information that um, this commenter seems to have would be helpful in making decisions about what priority products we may want to identify. And if there will be um, changes carried out in the supply chain, it will be important to be transparent about this substitution. So at this point, we're really in an information gathering uh, phase. And I think another thought I had is that the alternatives analysis process in our regulations is specific to our program, so there may, even though others may have done alternatives analyses for other purposes, they may or may not apply exactly to the criteria that we have in our program. Anybody want to? Uh, I would only add, this is Meredith Williams, I would only add that while some products in some industries may have already considered the alternatives for NPEs, we don't have a, a comprehensive uh, inventory of where that's been done and where it hasn't, and there may be some products where the transition has not yet happened. I think Carl will yeah, go so, to the next question. Um, uh, there's a this is a four-part question. Uh, the first one is, given the numerous candidate chemicals and nail products and numerous products, to what degree can you consider multiple products or chemicals? And the answer to that is, we have a lot of flexibility. We can name more than one chemical in a product. Um, so it could be one or more chemicals in a, in a priority product. We could name multiple products with multiple chemicals. It's a function of what information we have and what makes sense um, in terms of what we prioritize. So even in, in the 
The nail salon sector is a great example of there's a variety of distinctly different products that have um, different chemicals used, and we'll be evaluating all of those and seeing which ones make the most sense to focus on. The next part of the question is, has DTSC cross-referenced these chemicals with chemicals in nail products present on the Health and Human Services Household Products Database? And the answer is yes. We use the HPDB as one of the data sources uh, in the first phase of our process to identify a shorter list of candidate chemicals and products. So we did look at that as one of our, our sources to see uh, and inform us as we distilled through these different categories. Next part of the question is, if EPA selects one of these substances for prioritization, will SCP program be suspended? The short answer to that is no, um, in that um, you may be familiar with that, that the Toxic Substance Control Act, Act was amended this year on there extensively, and US EPA is in the process of implementing the new act. Um, we will be, of course, paying close attention to the activities that EPA does and we will take action as appropriate. Uh, there are, as you may know, potential um, situations where we might be preempted from action, but there are also waiver provisions, and um, EPA will be working through the end of this year and into next year about how they set priorities um, and how their process will work. So we're moving forward, um, and as appropriate, we will take action if necessary. Uh, that's kind of a roundabout way of saying um, we're going to see the course, and as EPA takes action, we'll, we'll um, respond as appropriate. Um, that we can have a much further, longer dialogue on TSCA reform and its implications, but we don't have time for that today. I uh, will say that we have a good relationship with US EPA, and we understand, at least we do now, and um, we uh, hope that that will continue and um, we'll be moving forward. Uh, the last part of this question was, as to the use and application data, what is the source of SCP information? This is where I would encourage you to look at our background documents for each of the three sections, and you can see you know, the references that are in there, and we're generally using publicly available information. This is also an opportunity if you have additional information that might not be in the public domain or might be obscure that we don't know about, we would appreciate you letting us know uh, what that information is and where to find it. Uh, next couple of questions we received, um, one is, for articles that may contain substances of concern, how will SCP manage imports? Well, if we identify a priority product in regulation um, and that product enters California by import, we still um, reach back to the manufacturer and they're responsible if they want to sell or offer for sale their product in California to be in compliance with our regulations. If the manufacturer chooses not to comply with that, there's a hierarchy of responsibility in our regulations which goes downstream and goes to the, to the importer. The importer then is essentially, if the, the manufacturer doesn't comply, the importer is essentially required to comply once we notify them that the manufacturer is not. At that point, um, they can either act uh, as the manufacturer would or they can cease import of that product into California. And the same is true for re retailers. If the importers don't comply, the retailers, uh, uh, their provisions would specify how they would uh, essentially not allow the sale of that product in California anymore. Um, the next part of that question is, what were some of the products that did not make the top three lists? Well, we obviously looked at a lot of other potential priority products and categories uh, subcategories of, from our work plan. We're not prepared right now to give you what all those are. We're focusing on these three we've put out for you today. And as we work through those, we will be identifying potential priority products. And we will continue this dialogue in, in successive rounds of information collection and dialogue on other specific categories and subcategories that we're looking at. So it's a little premature to worry about that right now. But the three we're presenting today are what we're focusing on. Um, I think Andre has the next question. All right. <clears throat> so this question, um, there's two parts again to, to this one. In the survey due November 30th, is the survey due November 30th intended primarily for manufacturers and suppliers? That is, are the questions mainly technical and best responded to by product formulators, for example? The answer is um, 
the, the questions are are not specifically technical in the survey, and it's for anyone who wants to be part of our dialogue. Some of the things that we ask in the survey are things like your preferred uh, communication preferences, um, meeting dates, things like that. So uh, you don't need to be a uh, chemist or a product formulator to respond to the survey. Right. Our, our stakeholder list is, is broader than that. So anyone who has input, data, information for us, we um, have a spot for you at our meeting. And then the second part has to do with PFASs. It says, regarding PFASs, shorter chains don't seem to be a truly safer alternative. How do we avoid a small tweak that doesn't resolve the problem? And I think that's really part of what we're asking, the types of information that we're hoping to gather through this engagement with our stakeholders. Um, so we want to understand what the hazard characteristics and physical chemical properties and things like that are for the PFASs. So we're hoping that we'll be able to better answer that question through this dialogue. Simona, do you have anything to add to that? I thank you. You answered it, yes. This is, this is related to some of the questions that we have for you in our questions list, um, and we hope to get at this better through our stakeholder engagement and the workshop. Thank you, Simona. And I think uh, Meredith will read you the next question and, and our response. Okay. The next question is, does DTSC have a strategy for proactive management, i.e., for identifying and prioritizing unknown or unmonitored chemicals? Um, we work very closely with other state agencies and departments who have direct responsibility for chemicals monitoring. Um, in particular, we are a partner in the state's biomonitoring program, Biomonitoring California, along with our uh, sister agencies in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and the Department of Public Health. And then we also are um, working closely to stay on top of um, work that's being done by the State Water Resources Control Board in, through their, their Chemicals of Emerging Concern initiative. And so while, while we don't have direct responsibility, we do try to um, communicate closely and regularly with those other organizations so that they know um, what some of the chemicals that we're <clears throat> particularly concerned about. We do maintain a list of chemicals that have been brought to our attention but aren't currently on our, con our candidate chemicals list, and we can add chemicals to our list either through our own regulatory action or through the petition process. So um, it, I wouldn't say it's a strategy, but we have, a, we have multiple tools for continuing to look at emerging contaminants and then emerging chemicals. Think yeah, I think uh, the next question is, I have a question regarding chemical product combinations having to do with nail products. DBP and other candidate chemical VOCs can hide in fragranced personal care products, and more and more nail products include fragrance. Will you be investigating the fragrance industry's use of candidate chemicals in fragranced nail products? Well, certainly we understand that some of the challenges in understanding what specific chemicals are in fragrances, um, and so this is one of the reasons we're having this dialogue. Uh, we will hope that as we have this discussion, we'll get more information on some of those potential candidate chemicals and fragrances, and we uh, will be asking uh, manufacturers to provide us some insight on that, um, and anyone else who has good information. Uh, the second part of the question is, with respect to PAFS, PFASs, how do you plan to address data gaps such as those identified in the EPA's health effects support document for short changed PFASs published in 2016? Again, this is why one of the reasons uh, Simona highlighted uh, our concern with PAFSs, and we will be, we're going to be asking a lot of co specific questions about how to fill data gaps for this and other parts of uh, potential concerns with PAFS exposure. So. Um, We'll be looking forward to the response on that. All right, I guess maybe I have the next question here. Um, this one is um, relating to nail products, maybe. Uh, how will you consider nail product chemicals that are found in levels considered to be trace 
under the OSHA HASCOM standards, i.e. less than 1% or 0.1% for reprotoxicants or carcinogens, respectively. So under the Safer Consumer Product Regulations, we can specify an alternatives analysis threshold be below which a responsible entity wouldn't or potential responsible entity wouldn't be on the hook to do alternative analyses. However, a decision to do that would really depend on the specific chemical, its exposure potential, uh, things like that. So it would come down to um, ultimately the potential for the chemical at that concentration to have uh, p potential for uh, adverse impacts that's either, either significant or widespread adverse impact. So it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. And I've been reminded to say who's speaking, this is Andre. Uh, so, I think we may have another question, and I'll we have a couple more questions. Carl We're just might. getting order on that. Um, so, uh, this one is: Can you clarify how the program distinguishes between intentionally and unintentionally added chemicals? Perhaps using the example of MPEs used in textile processing and residues left in finished garments. Well, first of all, um, we don't necessarily distinguish at all between. Uh, intentionally and unintentionally added if we, we know that chemi kinetic chemical is, is present in the, the, the product that we've defined. We do have the ability to address um, unintentionally added chemicals and establishing an alternative assessment threshold, for example, but essentially if we know that the chemical's in the product, we can list it as a priority product. Um, I think that the issue comes down to the challenges in identifying what specific chemicals are in the product, where they come into the supply chain, if in fact they're not intentionally added, and, and that um, if we were to pursue that process through the alternatives analysis process, you would be uh, required to look at alternatives that would um, hopefully ensure that that unintentional chemical uh, was eliminated from the supply chain. Uh, the next part of the question is, are you also focusing on trichocarban and some of the other 19 antimicrobial uh, chemicals listed in the FDA final rule, safety and effectiveness of consumer antiseptics and total topical antimicrobial drug products for over-the-counter use. I'm going to pump this one over to Ann Cooper, who uh, can address that. Um, well, so trichlorocarbon um, right now is actually not on our list. Um, but I think as with any of these, as we mentioned in one of our questions, we're definitely seeking information about other chemicals that may be of concern. Um, some that are candidate chemicals, and if there are that are potentially not candidate chemicals, that would be of interest as well. So if you have specific information about particularly aquatic impacts in that arena, that'd be welcome. And, and this is Daphne Mullen. Just one other point on that is our candidate chemicals list does change, uh, not just through our actions, but through the actions of the other authoritative lists we have. So if another body like Biomonitor, you know, for example, or CDC, um, and Haynes report, if they if a chemical were to get added to that list, um, it does get added to ours as well. So um, that's why we, we update our list quarterly. We have a question that is, um, when focusing on PFASs, does this really mean all fluorinated products? So uh, the simple answer to that it would be no. First of all, we mean we, we're restricted to products, of course, that fall within our work plan categories. And secondly, as we go along and continue to narrow down the scope, we will be very specific about what products that we're looking at. Um, and, and we have to consider those criteria that Carl Palmer described about the potential for exposure and the potential for that exposure to contribute to or cause significant or widespread adverse impact. And so um, when we consider that those criteria, it definitely narrows down the types of fluorinated products that we may have interest in. I have another question or two here. Uh, this is Andre Algazi speaking. So this is sort of two parts. The first is, what criteria and filters did you use to narrow down the, the, to these three product types? So uh, first, really these topics are broader than three product types. I guess um, in the case of the NPEs and the triclosan, they cut across multiple product categories, as does the PFAS. So it could be quite a bit more than three product types. 
as far as arriving at these three topics, I sort of very give a very sort of high level overview of, of our process. So the main filters and criteria were the policy priorities identified in the priority product work plan for 2015 to 2017, as well as the key prioritization principles that there has to be potential for exposure and potential for adverse impact. Um, we looked at data sources uh, that would help us sort of identify which chemicals. Um, so, for example, for aquatic resources, we looked at um, 303 lists to find chemicals that were actually detected in water quality. So, for example, that would be one of the ways that we narrowed down to specific chemicals like NPE and triclosan. Um, so really it was just the policy priorities, the key prioritization principles, the candidate chemicals list. Um, the second part, will DTSC be providing ca cast numbers for chemicals of interest? This, that would help stakeholders understand whether they are potentially involved, particularly for the PFAS's and NPEs. So as we touched on earlier, both the PFAS's and NPEs are broad categories. and. Uh, at this point, we are talking about them as, as classes, as groups, and we would like um, you know, to gather more information, fill some data gaps, answer some questions. At some point in the future, that kind of information may allow us to be a little bit more specific. So right now, we aren't uh, narrowing our focus to subsets of those ca classes of chemicals. And of course, when we, if we are naming priority products in regulation, we have to provide adequate specificity so that a manufacturer understands whether or not they're included in the priority product definition. I have another couple of questions. Okay. Okay. Um, this is Carl. I'll start. Uh, uh, one is, what difficulties or challenges have you faced with imports into California since the rise of e-marketplaces? Have you had any successes? Well, I'm not quite sure the focus of the question other than we haven't um, faced the challenge of regulating anyone in the e-marketplace yet, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we, we certainly um, have challenges and benefits. The e-marketplace uh, gives us more information, but we do note that their supply chains and the channels for products are complex. And we know that that'll be something we'll be addressing as we ultimately enforce our regulations once we get to that point. Can I add on? Yes, please. So, and that is one reason why, for instance, we are concerned about the low-pressure spray polyurethane foam systems. Those are systems that can easily be bought online with um, by anyone, and a do-it-yourselfer may not be familiar with their product and may not have the information they need to be adequately protective. So we do know that the presence of products um, through online channels does introduce another level of complexity that we need to think about. Um, thank you, Meredith. Uh, the next question is, what are some of the major successes that you've had so far, either in the policy or industry regulation areas? And this is Carl. Um, I'll highlight a couple, uh, certainly within the work we've done on our initial priority products. Uh, we've had extensive engagement with those stakeholders, which has been very helpful in informing everyone as to what our concerns are, why we're looking at these products, and, and the, the industries and stakeholders that are involved have given us a lot of valuable information, which has helped us revi refine our thinking and have made those regulations packages that are forthcoming uh, much stronger. Um, I think that also, the, today is a good example with the, the large amount of participation in this process, which shows that um, we are being successful in engagement in terms of getting information. Um, I'm, Meredith, I'm not sure if you want to add anything um, on a bigger picture, but I would I would only say that um, it's not neither. I wouldn't necessarily categorize this as policy or, or regulation areas, but in terms of building a program that is, uh, does work of high quality, does, uh, establishes some transparent, repeatable processes so that our stakeholders can understand how we're going about our decision-making process. We've been making great strides toward that. 
I think um, we're committed to con continuing that, both in terms of the quality and the transparency. And uh, I think I've heard directly from stakeholders that they feel as though we're being successful in that area. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't think we have any. Oh, wait. I think uh, James is looking to see if we have any last questions. One more. It's coming. Um, James. This question is, again, this is Carl. What metric will SCP use to determine achievement, determine achievement of goals? For example, if MPE is no longer present in the priority products, is that the goal? I think there are a number of metrics that we can use uh, in, in determining our success. Um, most importantly, I think, is the metrics that will come when we can demonstrate that when we've identified a product that contains a chemical that harms people or the environment, that we'll be able to look at many of the sources we're looking at now, whether that's water quality monitoring, air monitoring, the presence of chemicals in products, and biomonitoring to show that that chemical of concern actually is reduced in, the, in our environments and we have reduced exposure to people and the environment. Fundamentally, um, there's been a lot of dialogue about the focus of our program and is it a risk assessment program or is it a hazard reduction program. The reality is it's both. We know that by reducing hazards that you can reduce uh, risk and it's important to look at exposure as well. But we'll be able to see many times in the long term the effectiveness of our program through monitoring. I think the other thing is there are short-term uh, successes. We've had, and we'll see that as we continue this process, in the, the quality of our decision making here at DTSC that we can support, as Merida said, in clear and transparent manner, our use of good science and our policy discretion to show that we're picking products which make a difference. And so ultimately, we'll see that. And I would add to that that it, I think uh, another metric that we're really hoping to see is the proliferation of greener, green chemistry-based approaches to product design, um, co um, manufacturers starting to integrate alternatives analysis concepts and practices into their normal business operations. Um, and just a general sea change, which is already underway with or without the safer consumer products regulations, but I do think that we can bolster those efforts and hopefully spread them to a, uh, to a wider number of companies and stakeholders. Um, but I do think that there's a ripple effect from the actions we take and, and the, the overall framework. All right, well, that was a great question to end on. And thank you for all of our um, our presenters here for their great presentations and great Q and A. That w I really appreciated that. So I'll pass it over for Carl for some closing remarks here. Thanks, Daphne. Um, first, I want to thank um, the DTSC staff who worked extremely hard on doing all the work to get us to where we are today, and that we'll be working with all of you in the future. Uh, and so thank you to them. But thank you all of you um, who are online today for your participation and engagement. And my request is that you continue that uh, by looking at the things that we're putting out today, by reading the background documents, by completing the surveys, by, by providing input to us uh, through our CalSAFER information management system and all these other forums for which you will have an opportunity to give us good information that will help us make smart decisions, will move this process forward, and ultimately, will help us ensure that we are making uh, progress on ensuring that products are safe for people and the environment. So thank you today, and I'm thanking you in advance. Um, if there's any, any other questions, you've got plenty of opportunities to ask us, and we'll look forward to an ongoing dialogue with all of you. So with that, that concludes this webinar, and we'll be talking to you in the future. Thank you.